Good evening, welcome to another show on Africa and leadership. It's great to have you with us from wherever you might be watching across Africa and beyond. Now this week we host Ndanatse Bofu Tawamba, a Zimbabwean national who's the CEO and executive director at Urgent Action Fund Africa. She shares her views on the continent. We get your views on the issues as well. And we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishuru. Ndanatse Bofu Tawamba, known to many simply as Ndana, has a wealth of experience in human rights programming, social marketing, resource mobilization, and overall management of gender justice programs in developed and developing countries. And she heads Urgent Action Fund Africa. Now, prior to joining UAF Africa, Ndana was in charge of the UN Women Office in Harare, Zimbabwe. Ndana has lectured at the Women's University in Africa and is a social justice advocate. She also sits on the board of the International Network of Women's Funds. Let's get her thoughts on Africa. Thank you, Ndana, so much for joining the Africa Leadership Dialogues. And at a time when it seems to be a very exciting moment for women in Africa, mm -hmm. the Urgent Action Fund Africa has gathered a group of uh, just about 400 women, mm -hmm. uh, quite a number of uh, African women, some from further afield, mm -hmm. uh, in Malawi, where Joyce Banda is, of course, president, mm -hmm. uh, the second woman African president on the continent. and. Um, there still, though, are challenges mm -hmm. uh, for African women. Mm -hmm. Going by what has been shared mm -hmm. at the conference mm -hmm. in terms of experiences, opportunities, and challenges, what mm -hmm. struck you the most? I think what struck me the most is the persistent narrative about African women that we are hearing, not only on the continent, but internationally. Generally, there is a narrative that speaks to how African women are suffering. There is an unfortunate narrative of how African women do not have capacity. There is a worrying narrative of how young women are not responsible citizens. And for us, we were actually determined to say, how do we reshape and change this narrative? You know, from a negative narrative to a positive narrative. Because there are so many strides that the African women's movement have, have taken, you know, in ensuring that, you know, African women are on the lead, African women are on the rise, African women are integrated in leadership discourses. And that's the reason, really, why we thought that we should have this conference that not only articulates what it is that we are struggling with, but also how we can actually come about with solutions. Let's talk about what is a critical factor mm -hmm. and, and largely ignored, mm -hmm. but uh, over the past few days has been quite momentous, the intergenerational dialogue. Yes. Um, the learnings mm -hmm. and the gains that can be made by having the 70s mm -hmm. talk to the 20s and, and partner together in moving mm -hmm. forward. And in particular, you know, I'm struck by the fact that, you know, a generation of women who fought for independence literally in the bush with a gun yes. have sat and said, we were out there, we mm. fought, we took the bullets alongside our African brothers. Mm. But when it came to taking our space in leadership, yeah. we, did not, we did not get a place at the table. Mm. Where do you think the disconnect was here in Dana? I think there was a disconnect for sure. But I think also we really need to critically analyze, you know, where this disconnect was coming from. Remember, Africa had been colonized, and with colonization came a lot of patriarchal structures and systems that ensured that women were marginalized from most of the leadership um, structures that had been formed by our colonialists. And these structures were actually entrenched in the history of Africa. So even after independence, these structures carried on into the post-colonial period. And uh, with patriarchy, you know, it's, 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 it's something that 
it, it is a structure, it is an institution that is very difficult to dismantle. And with that, I think we really needed to start interrogating, you know, why that had been, that we had women in the bush that had not then been incorporated into the leadership positions that came after independence. And we are continuing to interrogate that status quo because we have a lot of challenges with it. So when you have some of these women who were in the bush also sitting on these chairs, you know, and, and really beginning to voice, you know, their concerns around why they had not been inter integrated into leadership positions, I think that's the kind of voice that we are seeking for African women to really begin to, um, to showcase and spotlight. It's, f it's fascinating mm. that you mentioned the colonial structures because mm. very often we blame our own cultures mm -hmm. for these things. And yet, you know, even the systems that came and were imposed upon us were extremely uh, patriarchal in, in, in nature. And that's, mm -hmm. Julie, patriarchy is everywhere. You know, it is in the culture, it is in our religion, it is in our institutional and governance, you know, processes. It is everywhere. And, you know, it is something that we really need to prioritize, you know, when, because again, when we talk about feminism, people think, oh, feminism is about women who hate men. It isn't about that. Feminism is really about interrogating the status quo. And for us, when we talk about the status quo, it's processes, structures, institutions, and how people live in their societies. And we are saying, how do we really begin to dismantle that and really bring about gendered societies? Let's, let's talk now about the struggles that young people mm -hmm. on this continent are facing mm -hmm. and, and really feeling as women mm -hmm. who, are, who are young, mm -hmm. th their voices are not heard, mm -hmm. perhaps they're not taken quite as seriously. Mm -hmm. When they do fight for the space, people say mm -hmm. they're being a nuisance. Exactly. You know, um, how, how would you encourage young women in mm -hmm. Africa to continue to, to take that space that they need to take mm -hmm. in representation, whether it's in politics, mm -hmm. uh, around economic issues? Mm -hmm. Do you know, I think what is, what is actually coming out of this conference is very interesting because yesterday we had in one of the sessions how young women are usually referred to as leaders of tomorrow and how it is important actually for us to realize that young women are not leaders of tomorrow, they are leaders of today and tomorrow. Young women are already leading. You know, we have a lot, we have high unemployment rates in Africa and we are seeing young women taking initiative, innovative initiatives in technology, cross-border trading, you know, uh, in the arts. And, and for me, those areas are also areas where we are seeing young women and young men shining and taking leadership and taking and claiming power. So I think, you know, in terms of their claim power in various spaces. We are also seeing, we, we had a woman sitting here from Tunisia who became a, an MP at the age of 24. That is what we are talking about. 20 women, to 22 this actually. Is it, 20, at 22, yes yes, 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 at 22. So for us, this is the kind of leadership we are talking about. And it's not only leadership in politics, it's not only leadership in, in business, but also leadership in their communities. Mm -hmm. In the home, in the community. Absolutely. Which, which, which on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of mm -hmm. women are doing. They, they yes. are managers of the home. Absolutely. They are balancing budgets in the home. So you're already doing it at, at, at a certain level. Absolutely. It's about having the confidence to expand yes. your influence. Absolutely. Let's talk about how stakeholders mm. across the continent can play a role in changing the narrative that you uh, described a short while ago. First and foremost, I'm really grateful that you have arranged for this interview because we I think really need to begin interacting and engaging with the media very constructively. Um, we are seeing more and more women really doing that. And I think media is also really beginning to respond positively towards women. And even as we are talking about that, the generality of media still portrays women very negatively. And I think this is something that um, has to do with profits. You know, when, when media re reports about what is happening in the women's movement, in most cases, it is about how women are fighting, you know, uh, for territory, for power, how women are fighting each other and pulling, the, and pulling each other down. And yet there's so much more positive work that is happening out there mm -hmm. that is being spearheaded and initiated by women. Say, for instance, in Nairobi, we do have a lot of IHUBs, you know, that are being led by women. Mm -hmm. Nobody reports about that. Women there in technology so are, are across Africa are, are increasing. You right? know, that there's so much that is taking place in the cross-border industry. Women building homes, women educating children, women, you know, ensuring that nations 
economies thrive because of cross-border trading. Say, for instance, in Zimbabwe, we have a lot of cross-border traders who sustained the country when it was in economic doldrums. Nobody reported about that. And we're saying, how do we really begin to change this narrative? And how do women's voices begin to be heard for what they're worth? Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. very interesting that in so many ways women are held down in our society but if you look at, at the at the heart of, of many African cultures mm -hmm. there's a deep respect for the woman mm -hmm. and so when a woman is insulted mm -hmm. or when a woman strips in protest mm -hmm. it is an absolute affront mm -hmm. to, to a whole community mm -hmm. how do we start to get in touch mm -hmm. and reconnect with our cultures mm -hmm. that really did revere and celebrate the role of the woman. Thank you for bringing that on, uh, Julie. Um, at this conference, uh, we had one of our um, esteemed delegates as the Her Royal Highness, uh, Queen of Uganda, who was really here to articulate around the role of, you know, of, of culture and traditions in ensuring that that woman's space, you know, and place in the community still, you know, is reserved for her to be able to lead her communities to greater heights. And it was actually very interesting that we also had a side session that was led by Elizabeth Luanga that was really beginning to look into some of the cultural and pan-African values and you know principles that we have lost. Somehow we have lost. Because when you look at the leadership that is currently obtaining on the continent, you know, somehow there is a lot of corruption, there is a lot of um, disrespect for you know for african for african values and and ethics and we're saying how do we begin to engage with these how do we bring them back you know on board how do we go back to the drawing board and say where have we missed the point and how do we again appreciate our traditional leaders as national leaders because again more and more we are seeing our political leaders as national leaders but the space for traditional leaders has somehow, you know, decreased, um, decreased declined. absolutely mm -hmm. declined, yes. So how do we start? To, is it mm -hmm. through engaging like this? Mm -hmm. Is it through talking about it? Is it through education? How do you think we start to, to address that? I think we really need to go back to, to the education curriculum. Because for me, in as much as we say education is important, what kind of education are we talking about? Because when you look at the curriculum that we have, most of it is emanating from still the you know pre-colonial history you know we are still talking very much about europe about you know the west and not necessarily about africa so how about we review some of the curricula that we're using and really begin to you know to put our culture on the pedestal where it belongs because again we, once we have lost our values those it will be very difficult to regain them and we're saying let us put those values and you know and traditions in the in the you know in the curriculum and we will see what will happen. It's so fascinating that you mention that because I'm sure in a lot mm. of countries it's been a long time since I was in school but I'm mm. sure if we go back mm. they're still probably studying David Livingston Absolutely. discovered this, this is Henry it. Morton Stanley discovered that Absolutely. and yet Africans have lived in Africa around yes. these mountains, rivers, lakes <laughs> for the longest time so we're calling upon the education, mm. the educationists and the academics let's start to get to work. Yes. Um, let's start to Look at the vision mm. of the Africa that we can be. Yeah. In many ways, we are heading there. Mm. But if we don't address the huge challenges that mm. face the continent mm. in terms of inequity, yeah. poverty, even as some of our economies power ahead, mm. we will remain uh, in, in big problems. Absolutely. So what are the critical things mm. that you think each and every Africa needs to do mm. to start being part of the change that we all want to see? It's a good thing that you're bringing that on, Julie, because um, when you look at how there's this narrative, consistent narrative, that Africa is on the rise, you know, how we have seven to eight countries that are, you know, economically rising um, as, as African countries in the world. I think with that narrative, we should also be questioning and interrogating. When we say Africa is on the rise, how do we really begin to translate the economic growth that we're seeing, you know, into the well-being of our, you know, of our constituents? of our communities, of our people, you know, and how do we really begin to engage, the, you know, 
bring the whole community to be able to participate and facilitate some of that economic growth. And we should not only just concentrate on it, because economic growth is nothing, you know, without social growth. You know, there has to be that social fabric that we continuously have to weave and need to ensure that even as we are achieving economic growth, our societies are also growing mm -hmm. in a way that socially we can begin to accept each other. I believe there's so much violence in our communities right now. In Africa, whenever we are having elections, we are seeing sites of violence. And that violence does not just come about, you know, when there are elections. That violence is sitting somewhere and Un nobody doesn't seem. Issues. Do you underlying mm -hmm. issues? How do we really begin to engage on those structural challenges that we are facing? Say, for instance, in our communities, we do have a lot of, you know, our communities that are no longer nurturing the child or the young ones, the way in which you and I were nurtured. Mm -hmm. You know, these more Which is very un-African. Mm, which is it's very <laughs> un-African. You can actually have children who will never say good morning to anybody, mm -hmm. you know, because that is the way in which they are being nurtured and socialized. How do we go back to our roots to ensure that even as we are talking about leadership, the kind of leadership that we want to see is a responsible, respecting, you know, kind of leadership that when it gets to a stage where somebody is leading a country, we have somebody who has their roots intact, who have their African, Pan-African values and, you know, principles intact, but who will be able to guide us in a manner that is appropriate and context uh, specific for Africans. Mm. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to give your message mm -hmm. to Africa. But before you do that, mm. uh, give us some inspiration. What are some of the mm -hmm. things happening on the continent mm. that you think need to be celebrated mm. and lauded mm -hmm. and, and are progressive? I can specifically talk about the kind of strides that the African women's movement has, you know, has achieved thus far. Um, we currently have um, two women heads of state, you know, um, uh, Her Excellency Ellen um, Johnson Salif. Uh, we have uh, Her Excellency Dr. Joyce Banda. This is why we are in Malawi, mm -hmm. so that we can also celebrate and spotlight some of the achievements that That's she has so recorded. Good. And we are saying out of nine global heads of states, two are from Africa. I mean, that is worth celebrating. We are saying already we have um, Dr. Nkosa Zanazuma at the African Union uh, Commission, and we are saying we also really need to celebrate that. But we do have a number of vice presidents. We do have prime ministers. We do have a number, I mean, a growing number of cabinet, female cabinet ministers. We have business women. We have women in the communities. You know, those invisible stories mm -hmm. that you don't hear every day. And we are saying, how do we really begin to celebrate and really champion that narrative of women who are on the rise. Mm -hmm. mm. If you're an African woman, even at whatever level, mm -hmm. uh, business, uh, whichever sector, um, in, the, in the government, or and, and even some young women going into agriculture and mm -hmm. transforming communities, mm -hmm. got a lot of women running children's homes and looking after the children in the community, take a moment to celebrate yourself because we celebrate you and we thank you for the example that you set for others on the continent. As a final mm. word, please, mm. Ndana, would you look into the camera mm. and deliver your message to the African continent? Thank you, Julie. Um, I believe Africa is on the rise. And I think even as Africa is on the rise, Africa should rise with its people. Africa should rise with its women. And I believe that this is time for women of Africa to not only demand that they be given you know, responsibilities and power, but also to lead, you know, and even as we are saying we are leading, we are really claiming power, you know, because again, if you're given power, it can easily be taken away from you. But when you claim power, you own it. Thank you. Claim your power, take your space and own it. Thank you so much. Nda. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Dana Tawamba, I'm the Executive Director of Agent Action Fund Africa. You're watching Africa Leadership Dialogues. A passionate woman who believes in this continent. Thank you, Dana, for sharing your views with us. And it's time now to get your views on the issues. This week's question, in your view, how can NGOs in Africa have a greater impact on sustainable community development? Cherono Richard says, 
Community development works well and is sustainable when communities themselves own the projects. Community ownership can be attained in an all-inclusive project execution process with a clear exit or face-out strategy. Felix Kibbut Chircher says, NGOs play an important role in our communities, but I would suggest that they focus themselves on economic growth and inculcate this in the society so that sustainable development after the expiry of their terms will be maintained. Hi, my name is Mariam Bishar. I think that NGOs are currently doing a lot to aid sustainable community development in Africa, but if there was anything more that they could do, it would probably be longer term solutions as opposed to just reactions when problems happen, like setting up irrigation schemes instead of just uh, giving food aid when there's already drought and famine, and civic education to prevent human rights abuses or breaches of democracy and such things. So probably if that happened, then we could see more sustainable community development in Africa. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Twitter, at Africa LD, and on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus Thank you for sharing your views. Keep them coming in each week. We appreciate your participation. Now to Africa's top 10. On Africa's top 10 this week, we feature the top power women in Africa from Ventures Africa. Starting us off at number 10 is Diazani Alison Madweke, Minister of Petroleum Resources in Nigeria. Diazani has served as Nigeria's Minister of Transportation and also Mines and Steel Development. In April 2010, she was appointed Minister of Petroleum Resources, which she holds the primary responsibility for the stewardship of Nigeria's vast oil and gas resources. Positioned at number 9 is Joyce Mujuru, Vice President of Zimbabwe. Joyce Mujuru is a Zimbabwean politician who has served as Vice President of Zimbabwe since December 2004. Previously, she served as a government minister for years, beginning at independence in 1980. She is also Vice President of ZANU-PF. She is considered as a potential successor to President Robert Mugabe. Gail Marcus, Governor of the Reserve Bank of South Africa, takes the number 8 spot. Gail Marcus is the first woman to hold this position. Marcus was previously a chair of the APSA Group Limited. She has previously served as Deputy Governor of the South African Reserve Bank and holds a degree in Industrial Psychology. Coming in at number 7 is Isabel Dos Santos, daughter of Angola's President Jose Eduardo Dos Santos. She is an Angolan investor and is considered by Forbes to be the richest woman in Africa and the most powerful and richest woman in her country. At number 6 is Grasha Machel, Chancellor of the University of Cape Town. Grasha Machel has served on boards of numerous international organizations including the UN Foundation, the Forum of African Women Educationalists, the African Leadership Forum and the International Crisis Group. She is an international advocate for women's and children's rights and in 1997 was made a British Dame for her humanitarian work. Grasha Machel is the only woman in history to have been First Lady of two separate republics, serving as First Lady of Mozambique from 1975 to 1986 and the First Lady of South Africa from 1998 to 1999. Slotted in at number 5 is Dr. Dambisa Moyo. This Zambian-born economist is a New York Times bestseller who brought a fresh narrative on the table with her publications and books, particularly Dead Aid, Why Aid is Not Working and How There is a Better Way for Africa, published in 2009, and Winner Take It All, China's Race for Resources and What It Means for the World, published in June 2012. Dr. Dambisa Moyo is an alumni of Oxford University and Harvard University. In 2009, she was named by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Ngozi Okonjo Iweala comes in at number 4. This Harvard alumna is a globally renowned Nigerian economist, best known for her two terms as finance minister of Nigeria, which is her current position. Under her leadership, 
Nigeria has witnessed a 6.5% increase in GDP from 2011 to 2012, as reported by Forbes. She is also known for her work at the World Bank, including several years as one of its managing directors from October 2007 to July 2011. In 2012, she became one of the three candidates in the race to replace the World Bank president, but was unsuccessful in her bid. At number three is Her Excellency Dr. Nkosazana Clarice Dlamini Zuma. Dr. Nkosazana is an undisputable trailblazer in the uplifting and empowerment of women across the African continent. In July 2012, Her Excellency Dr. Dlamini Zuma was elected chairperson of the African Union Commission by the heads of states in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. She is the first woman to lead the continental organization. Taking the number two spot is President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, first female head of state on the continent. President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was a strong leader war-torn Liberia desperately needed. Since she came to power, Liberia has been able to move forward. This African icon and Harvard University graduate has survived civil wars and exiles. In 2011, she received a joint Nobel Peace Prize for her nonviolent struggle for the safety of women and for women's rights to full participation in peace-building work. And at number one this week is Malawi's President Joyce Banda. Elected shortly after Liberia's President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, President Joyce Banda from Malawi is the most powerful African woman according to Forbes. She is the first female head of state in her country. According to Forbes, her first year was marked by major public health initiatives such as the $15 billion Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB and malaria. And that's Africa's Top 10 this week. It's time already for the quote of the week and that means we've come to the close of the show. This is a powerful one that has been shared by many people and has been paraphrased. Now, we quote Dr. Kwegir Agri this week. He says, if you educate a man, you educate an individual. But if you educate a woman, you educate a whole nation. I leave you with that thought. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa.